All right, I think we got a little bit of a, a lull here. You know, first and foremost, thank you so much for coming out and joining us today at Martyrs Camp. And I promised a bunch of you that the, the sun will rise a little bit higher. You know, I noticed that, you know, everybody wants to sit in that sun back there, but we'll warm up here in a few seconds. But you know what? What a perfect spot and a perfect opportunity to be outside in the forest and having all these people here today. So I'm pretty excited to, to welcome all of you. And just, you know, I'm gonna take a couple minutes and talk about a little bit about Mars Camp. Some of you, this may be your first time through here, but I just wanted to, to go through that. And I also wanna, first and foremost, I've been around for a little bit here I've uh, been walking this property, this 2,000 acres for since 2003, right? So, but there's a few other people and I want to recognize, you know, we have a couple people out here. I want to recognize Gus Jones, our COO of Mars Camp, and Colin O'Hanlon. Those guys are the, the backbone of the day-to-day -day business here and they, they make Mars Camp special. So I also want to just reach out to gather an event like this and also put in the, the request to have perfect weather for this. You know, Jamie Haddad, our community manager here, and Jeff Thorsby from Nevada County, you guys did a great job. They're absolutely professionals, but mainly the perfect weather, right? It's not easy to have this, and sitting outside in, you know, what, you know, it was 38 degrees now, it's kind of 39. So. <laughs> We have a heater, so we have the heater. So, but kudos to you guys and thank you so much for making this place and this event perfect. So I look forward to the rest of the morning. You know, um, as we move forward and you know, we talked about, I've been around for two, since 2000, right after this property was purchased. And this land here was, logged for decades and decades and it wasn't that this community just popped up out of the ground the first and foremost things we came in here and there were, the sponsors were able to spend millions of dollars just cleaning up this property there was three feet of litter on the ground the forests were just riddled and you know, forestry operations have you seen it gets a little messy and that was the first, that was the first step of getting this place to be where it is to this day. Then we had to go into the visions, right, of looking at the land planners and what we wanted to bring and, and provide to this community. But I tell you, the efforts that were involved in that were extraordinary. And that's what, that's what started our core values here. You know, when we looked at this property and the creek that bisects it, the forests that were here, the wildlife, we sat down, okay, what are we gonna develop for, for these communities and these communities for generations to come? And that set the stage for what we wanted to do moving forward to this day. And fortunate to be a part of a group that wants to continue that. And then, then we can show it, not just regionally, but nationally, of that a community of such as this can be, you know, in touch and with the environment and our surroundings. So it's, uh, and listen, that, those times of development, they weren't always easy as some of you in this this group know that road was that road was challenging at times and but those relationships were built trust was trust was earned and respect and we sat at tables and we listened to each other and we were able to make this community happen and it's it's uh, those are the trying times but I can say that we were able to pull that through and it was not an easy task. I remember a time, some of, some of you out there might know uh, Dr. Uh, Robert Coates. I worked with him extensively on our water quality program here and some of our uh, restoration projects. And uh, we spent a lot of time wandering these woods and the creeks and all that. And it wasn't always easy. And we, were, we argued a bunch. We had some great conversations. We had some great conversations of nitrogen fixation and snow and, and pollutants and all that. There was some fun stuff. But we also, we also figured out we had common ground. We all wanted the, we wanted the same thing. And we eventually got there. 
you know, and it was and it was pretty amazing. <laughs> we have one of the most state-of-the-art water quality monitoring programs that I've ever seen in there, and he's a part of that. And we want that too. We want clear water. We want pres the preservation. Now I want to say that Dr. Coates, I don't know, at the end, I don't know if he really liked, liked me, 2004, he, uh, if some of you remember the rain on snow event there and the streams were ripping, you know, he kept saying, he sounded like the Saturday Night Live skit, more cowbell, right? <laughs> he said that he kept calling me, hey, Scott, more sample, get more sampling. Well, that creek was, Marty's Creek was overflowing, if some of you remember. So, I don't know, he may have wanted to kick me out of here. So I think it's, uh, my point on that is this, how exciting it is to come to common ground. And it just takes a little respect and listening. So, you know, as we, uh, as we engage in this morning, you know, I want, to, uh, I want to encourage everybody here today, enjoy this morning sunshine, get your vitamin D in, right? But I encourage you just to, we're sitting in this forest in a perfect setting. Let that trigger your, your openness, your compassion, and unity. And let's see if we can work together, because as a group, you know, we can do it. And so I'll leave it at that. Again, thank you so much for being here and joining us. I am super excited just to have everybody here and getting all these great leaders together, regionally and locally. So thanks again. And I'm going to welcome Supervisor Hardy Bullock. Thank you so much, Scott. Um, yeah, it is about the environment. What an inspirational venue we have here today. Uh, incredible spot. And I've had other meetings here, which kind of um, triggered a conversation with Scott and Jamie and I and other people in Nevada County about getting an inspirational venue where we could get together and meet and talk about something that's important. And obviously, the energy we get from the woods and the trees and uh, this place that we call home is absolutely incredible and it can't be stopped. And that's why we're here today. So with that, I just really want to thank Scott Bauer, Jamie Haddad of Martis Camp and um, allowing us to be here today. I, I really appreciate it. It's a tremendous amount of work and we understand that and we honor uh, what you're trying to do here in protection of the environment and also creating a, a really special place. So thank you, genuinely. Um, I also want to thank, uh, thank our panel speakers for coming from uh, places near and far and also Supervisor Hall for moderating that panel. I'm really looking forward. I think you're going to get a lot out of the Bought it out of the speaker group. I also want to thank Jeffrey Thorsby and Ariel Lovett and Carissa Binkley and Sarah Hollyhead and obviously our CEO Allison Lehman for putting the effort into creating this event and supporting me in, the, in the, a vision to bring conservation and sustainability and that thought leadership here to Eastern County. I want to say thank you to them. And obviously to the Nevada County Board of Supervisors for supporting both my Triple C group and also the South Yuba cohort, which is a very important component uh, as we set objectives and priorities for Nevada County, both regionally through our legislative platforms at the state and federal pieces as well. So the Board of Supervisors as a whole has been quite supportive of that, and I want to thank them for their contributions and their commitment to our environment. I want to thank each and every one of you for taking the time to attend this inaugural event. You are the foundation of change, and every year I hope we can gather here to improve our service to our community to this region, to our state, and to our natural environment. My vision as a county supervisor is to integrate and unify our county, bringing solutions specific to District 5, to Eastern County, to the Truckee region that directly enhance the quality of life for our community. I can only accomplish this by supporting our county as a whole. As a whole, and working regionally with local, state, and federal partners. We're here today to protect our natural environment, and in doing so, promote health of our communities and a vibrant economy. It is our responsibility to remove the obstacles, create policy, and lead our shared community to a sustainable future. I want to thank you today for joining, but also every day, joining here today, but also every day, see you here next year as we take action steps to reduce environmental impact, enhance conservation and sustainability, and provide balance to our visitor-based economy and region. We originally had uh, 
Chairman Smokey that was going to come by and do our land acknowledgement, and he is delayed, so we're going to move that to the break. And with that, we're going to move into our keynote speaker. I'd like to welcome Jessica Morse. Jessica is the Deputy Secretary for Forest and Wildland Resilience at the California Natural Resources Agency. She is coordinating California's approach to wildfire resilience, including increasing the pace and scale of forest restoration and vegetation treatment. Jessica was the architect of the governor's $1.5 billion wildfire resilience strategy and developed the joint forest stewardship strategy between California and the U.S. Forest Service signed in 2020. Prior to joining Governor Newsom's administration, Jessica spent nearly 10 years in national security working for the Defense Department, State Department, and the U.S. Agency for International Development. Her assignments included a year and a half in Baghdad, Iraq, as well as tours in India, Myanmar, and the U.S. Pacific Command. Throughout her career, she designed and executed innovative strategies across agencies and governments, including a strategy using renewable energy technology transfer as a catalyst for U.S. defense engagement with India. Jessica is a fifth generation Northern Californian. She and her family still own their original homestead forest land in the Sierra foothills. Jessica is an outdoor enthusiast and can be found backpacking, skiing, and fishing throughout the Sierra. She hiked 500 miles of the Pacific Crest Trail. Miss Morris holds a Master's of Public Affairs from Princeton University and a Bachelor of Arts in Economics from Principia College. Thank you. In 2018, Morris ran for U.S. Congress in California's 4th Congressional District, and Supervisor Hall asked me to uh, let you know that she's keeping an eye on her. So, with that, I'd like to welcome Jessica Morris. all of you today. This feels like old home week coming up to Truckee. And, um, and it is so exciting to get to work with you guys. Um, you know, the Nevada County um, has really helped lead the charge um, and that sort of Placer Nevada, um, El Dorado combination. You really look at some forward thinking models that we're now trying to execute statewide. I think you guys set the foundation um, and have set the tone for what we're now trying to scale um, at the state. So I, my portfolio within uh, the California Natural Resources Agency, which I assume most of you know, that's the parent agency for CAL FIRE, State Parks, Department of Fish and Wildlife, our state conservancies like the Sierra Nevada Conservancy and Tahoe Conservancy. Um, so we're the, the parent agency and try to make sure that all of our strategies put all, give, get all hands on deck. Um, to actually get all of our departments and all of our resources to help um, empower local communities and support communities in delivering climate resilience. My portfolio is specifically the wildfire resilience actions. Um, and so I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about um, how, where we've come from in terms of wildfire resilience, where we're going and what resources we have that all of you can engage with um, to help continue this momentum. Um, so as all of you know, uh, wildfire resilience is really sort of that combination of century-long legacies of uh, you know clear cutting um, from you know from the gold rush era uh, leading to then overly dense forests uh, which are then weak and then that legacy of fire suppression uh, from the early 1900s with the Forest Service that then eliminated natural ecological fire from the landscape and so we've gotten to a state now where our forests are too dense to be able to withstand the climate pressures that are that are that are coming down on them and those climate pressures are going to continue to get more extreme um, in terms of drought heat um, and so the question is how do we get our forests and our ecosystems back to a state 
of resilience, where they can actually not only survive, but thrive in these hotter, drier conditions, and that we can get fire from these catastrophic fires that we've been seeing in the last decade back down to the normal historical fires um, and the ecologically adapted fires that tribes managed with for millennia in California. And how do we get that get to a state where we can have fire play its natural resilient role across the landscape and keep our community safe and thriving? Um, just to give you a little bit of perspective in terms of where we are uh, with the state of our forested ecosystems, Dr. Scott Stevens at UC Berkeley put out a paper um, this year that was highlighting um, the density, the unnatural density of our forests, um, identifying that in a lot of the Sierra, the, there's supposed to be about 40 trees per acre, and instead we often have about 400 trees per acre. And what that means is that those trees are then competing. So that means you have 400 trees rather than 40 competing for the same water, the same nutrients. Um, and that is what is then exacerbating that dense condition then means that those trees are not resilient when they're struck with extreme heat because they don't have enough water or nutrients to be able to withstand harsher conditions. Um, it means that they are then weak when they don't have enough drought to then produce the sap which pushes out the beetle. And so they are succumbing to beetle and that's how we lost 169 million trees throughout the Sierra, particularly in the Southern Sierra. What that did is it left dead standing trees um, on that landscape and uh, by 2020 those dead standing trees hit the ground and they weren't just standing fuel they were ground fuel and our ground fuel models I don't know if you guys know this they're generally estimated to be about three inch diameter wood on the ground is uh, what the sort of assumptions are for uh, fuel driven fires instead where you have high intensity tree mortality we started seeing 30 inch diameter wood on the ground that started causing these extreme conditions because then when that dead wood was drying out um, you had in these heat waves that we've had we had one this summer um, in 2020 where we were clocking in those record degree heats remember 130 degrees in death valley hottest point on the planet um, ever and and so we're clocking in these extreme heat it's like a kiln going over the entire uh, dead fuel in the forest so spine fuel and large fuel what we saw is that large fuel moisture um, after these heat waves we saw things like six percent eight percent fuel moisture in that dead down wood which means you have in your forests drier than kiln dried wood um, to be able to create that fuel and and so then when we got fires in 2020 and 2021 what happened is that that extreme um, dryness combined with the extreme fuel load and the weak trees meant that we had not just small fires but mega fires and we saw un unprecedented fires. Um, Four million acres burned in 2020. In 2021, we saw fire behavior like the Dixie Fire and the Caldor Fire, which were both um, in the month of August of 2021. And for the first time in pyrologic history, those were fires that crossed up and over the largest fuel break in the world, which would be the granite crest of the Sierra. You know, when I got a call from Cal Fire that said that Lake Aloha was on fire, I was like, it's just granite. I mean, how I many of you guys, most of you have been up there, right? Lake Aloha? Seeing some nods, okay. Um, anyway, it's, you know, you're talking about the granite of desolation wilderness, right? When, when fire is jumping lover's leap on Highway 50, which is a 500 foot cliff, you're talking about extreme conditions. And so we're in this battle where we have planetary forces, right? You have that extreme dryness, extreme heat, coupled with weakened forests that lead to these mega fires, which are extremely out of the norm. And, and so, and then they're causing then compounding climate challenges too, because we saw in the Dixie fire, Caldor fire, Tamarack fire last summer, First, the first time we had seen extreme fire in these upper, upper watersheds, top of our watershed, um, was burnt and almost nuked. And what that meant is that the water, the functionality of our Sierra, because we all know in terms of you know water hydrology and forest hydrology, that the Sierra itself is a much more effective reservoir than any dams we've ever built in terms of the quantity of water storage and allowing that water to percolate out through the rest of the year. 
Well, when you get hydrophobic soil after a fire, which is when it burns so hot, it creates a clay layer. It changes the nature of the soil, it creates a clay layer. We found on the Dixie fire that even after getting 11 inches of rain, it was still dry underneath that clay soil because all of the water just ran straight off, causes silting in our dams, causes damage to our water quality, and, and worst of all, it decreases and diminishes our capacity to have that natural um, watershed infrastructure functioning and storing water for us properly. So the question is, what do we do about this, right? We're in this, this compounding cycle where heat Drought um, exacerbates fire, which then exacerbates drought. Um, and we know that the weather conditions are not going to get easier in terms of the trend lines that we're facing. So can we have forests in the age of climate change? I have a great answer for you. Yes, we can. And you guys are doing it right here and modeling how it can be done. Uh, we, we have examples, for example, I was just in uh, Mexico and there are beautiful pine forests down um, in central Mexico and in Baja, California that are thriving, Jeffrey pines, cypress, junipers, that are thriving because they were never clear cut, they've been actively managed by lightning and they have the right resilient density to be able to handle the hotter, drier conditions even at, the, at those lower latitudes. So we know that forests can survive the hotter conditions coming for them. And so the question is, can we get them to the right structure and can we get the right infrastructure in place to support that? So. When we're talking about how do we create a state of wildfire resilience, there's three fronts that we are working on across the state in terms of direct wildfire resilience action. Every community is resilient when it does three things. And think of these as concentric circles, okay? Innermost circle, interventions inside of the community. That's gonna be your defensible space, your home hardening, um, because we know that homes burn from the inside out in a wildfire, right? It's embers getting into the attic, it's uh, vegetation against the window, causing direct heat and causing the window to explode and then flames getting in, right? So. We know that that home hardening and that defensible space work to make your homes ember resilient makes a big impact. There are interventions around communities. So that's your strategic fuel breaks where you're doing long thin strips of thin vegetation, miles long, couple hundred feet wide that give firefighters that tactical advantage during a firefight and also create safe evacuation routes for communities during large fires. Um, we saw this in the Calder fire. Uh, fuel breaks around Christmas Valley um, in Myers had uh, 150 foot flame lengths coming down the hill at them and then when it hit a shaded fuel break, which was just, you stood in it and you think natural density of trees without undergrowth, um, right, into, right in a neighborhood, backed up to homes. I, I looked at these, uh, the scoring and talked to the firefighters on the ground. They saw those flames go from 150 feet, so that's a 15 story building of fire, down to 15 feet when it hit the fuel break, which meant they could take a stand and protect those homes in that community, which is how we lost no homes in the Tahoe Basin during the Calder fire. It's also how the town of Pollock Pines was saved in the Calder fire. Um, and so we're seeing these fuel breaks make a huge impact um, and, and dramatically increasing the number and scale we have around the state. The last front is really across that whole landscape. Um, we don't want 150 foot flame lengths in our forests. That's not natural or healthy for our forests or our watersheds. We saw in the Calder fire that a, the Capels burn, a prescribed burn um, that had previously been used as the lesson of a prescribed burn that got out of hand because they had to uh, add some suppression onto it even though it didn't cause any damage. Um, that 3,000 acres that had burned in that prescribed burn um, a few years earlier meant that you, when the, when the Calder fire hit it, it actually burned underneath and arrested underneath that uh, prescribed burn outside of Kirkwood in that Cable's uh, footprint. And so that is a green patch of forest still standing today. So that, and uh, Sierra Nevada Conservancy has some amazing examples that maybe Angie will talk about later. Um, in the Sheep Fire and others, and the North Complex Fire, where, um, where they had done pretreatment across whole landscapes and you saw catastrophic full um, high severity burn switch to a low intensity healthy fire 
when it hit the fuel reduction. So we're seeing that we can actually by hand do what fire should have been doing for the last hundred years and then get our forests and our communities in a state where they can actually accept fire. So to be able to scale this up, so the answer is we know what to do. And you guys have modeled this really beautifully throughout um, Nevada County and throughout the Tahoe Basin um, for, for the last few decades. The question is, can we get to a scale that we're ahead of the climate conditions that we're facing? Because our interventions are getting better, but as we saw with the Dixie Fire and the Caldor Fire last year, the fires are getting worse. So what we've done in California is um, not only change the scale of investments in projects across those three landscapes and speed it up, we've also invested in interventions that are foundational to making sure that we can actually have the workforce, the business, the regulatory reform, um, and the scientific foundation, um, and the regional collaboration to ensure that we can actually hit that scale and sustain it. Um, and also get that triple bottom line of invention, in, investments in resilience actually delivering um, protections for communities and ecologies and good jobs. Um, and so I'm going to talk through a little bit about what we're doing. So last year was the first year we had attempted a scaled investment in wildfire resilience. Uh, we went from a budget in 2018 of 200 million to last year 1.5 billion dollars just in resilience alone. So this is in addition to fire suppression and firefighting costs. Um, and uh, and then this year, we just a couple weeks ago got locked in from the legislature an additional 1.3 billion dollars for these programs um, to be able to continue this momentum in wildfire resilience. So that means the state went from 200 million to now 2.8 billion dollars in just three years for wildfire resilience act actions across the state. And and I know it sounds great to have a lot of money, but it only really counts if we're getting it on the ground into projects. I'm pleased to report that within the first year of getting that 1.5 billion dollars 1.2 billion dollars is out the door into communities and has already delivered over a thousand projects throughout the state um, everything from defensible space chipping community hardening um, uh, workforce development uh, business development to actually get these actions on the ground quickly so what we've done is we've invested in actually our wildfire resilience program is 44 different programs implemented by 22 different departments throughout the state it's an all hands on deck approach so that's everything from cal fire state parks department of fish and wildlife um, and our conservancies and what's really critical is that those dollars so that they don't sort of turn into random acts of, of resilience across the landscape they are anchored into regional strategies so in your region sierra nevada conservancy is is your regional anchor and they work with a program we call the regional forest and fire capacity program to invest in local collaboratives um, and to be able to get planning dollars and um, capacity building dollars so staffing a support for things like resource conservation districts and local collaboratives and Angie uh, probably will talk more about those and and so into communities so that then when we have funding coming in for forest health grants um, that really work on that landscape uh, scale project or fire prevention grants through CAL FIRE that work more in that wooey area and those fuel breaks and community hardening efforts um, or, or programs that we have state parks has direct funding fish and wildlife has direct funding so that their land um, is fire resilient and not a burden on the rest of the community uh, we have funding for small forested landowners uh, which make up 26 percent of the small of the forest land in California but they're in like 100 acre 200 acre plots and so we don't want you know a fire's not going to skirt, skirt around uh, because the jurisdiction didn't have changed you know they're not gonna be like oh that's federal I'll move on and um, and so we what we do is we made sure that we had funding directly for every land ownership type and then anchored it in these regional collaborative plans so that the that we have planners at a watershed scale to be able to say all right how do we get a multi-jurisdictional approach here how do we funnel these dollars in so that they're having a cohesive impact on the landscape as well as getting that community investment back in um, these investments are are huge in terms of the impact we're seeing this fire season um, was significantly less dramatic 
than previous fire seasons, right? In 2020, we had four, over 4 million acres burn. Last year, we had 2.5 million acres burn. This year, in terms of acreage footprint, we had 366 acre, thousand acres burn this year. And so um, it's it's less. We still have more fire season. To, fire season is, is a misnomer. We have more of the fire year uh, to go until the next calendar year of fire starts. Um, but what we have is, and and what's exciting is that there was there was definitely some advantages in the weather, right? We all saw it, but there was also um, very deliberate action that was on the ground quickly that helped us. So things like the river fire, um, Cal Fire invested in um, ten new heli tankers that are the si that have the water capacity cl roughly close to a C130, and so we're able to get in and have direct attack on fires very quickly. So something like the River Fire um, near Grass Valley that would have been quite catastrophic, they were able to get a handle on very quickly, even though it was steep terrain, dry conditions. Um, and the Electra Fire down in Amador County, for example, um, was anticipated to be very big. It was kicking off a pyrocumulus, so its own weather system, on day one, and it it hit um, a strategic fuel break that we had put in place in the previous year um, and was able to stop uh, right at doorsteps of homes. I went there, it's a, it's a bright line of where it burned black and then um, and then you're back in, in dry grass again. Um, and, and the trees, uh, oak, it was rolling oak woodland, beautiful standing um, oaks still because that had been thinned out in advance. Um, and so we've seen uh, throughout the state these fuel reduction efforts actually making a tangible impact on communities really directly. Um, another thing I want to highlight, though, is additional funding that we, that is new in this budget, in addition to kind of those three fronts of resilience. This year, we've gotten new funding specifically for reforestation because we saw these upper watersheds so dramatically damaged that we wanted to ensure that we had resources um, for, for really targeting that reforestation so that we didn't see what were uh, conifer forests converting to shrubs and then impacting the watershed. So we want to get those watersheds functioning again. So we got direct funding for reforestation, both in terms of projects, but also in terms of workforce development. So you get cone collectors, seed banks um, going, and nurseries going so that we have that reforestation infrastructure. Because 7 million acres burned in the last two years, um, most of that focused on upper watersheds is a really um, high intensity and much larger scale than had been anticipated. Um, other, fun, other aspects I want to highlight too is that we've been really working, and I think the panel will talk about this more, to try to get the wood economy moving again because um, the challenge you have is that our infrastructure for what do we do with all of this woody material coming off the forests, right? We've seen in fires, even when it's piled into small slash piles, that if that, that that wood is not decomposing because we're not getting the moisture levels that we've historically had. And so when it doesn't decompose, it actually complicates a fire. We saw a fire that, um, you know, we've seen the the big slash piles, you know, the, that are like the size of this building. I don't know how many of you guys have gone up and seen those. Um, but there's, you know, big slash piles around that are just giant. Um, Cal Fire has to put whole engine crews on those slash piles during a firefight. And, um, and so what we've, uh, and then you have small slash piles that don't necessarily warrant sort of an engine crew and they don't necessarily create crown fires from them. But what we saw is that when we had the smaller slash piles on the ground, um, that when the fire burned through, it actually burned hot at the root of the trees and killed the forest anyway. And so getting that wood moved out into a destination that is better than open pile burning, um, not just in terms of carbon release, but also because your windows for pile burning are hit and miss, right? You saw that we saw the big prescribed fire in, Mexi in New Mexico that went off because of a pile burn that had smoldered for years. And so we want to make sure that, um, that we're actually treating these projects holistically start to finish um, and also the commercial post-fire salvage that that is removing enough wood so that you can actually reforest and you're not having these complications from slash on the ground. So the wood economy, we have some tools for it that we're putting into place 
The state's theory at this point is asking ourselves, what can we as the government do to remove barriers to the private sector to be able to then make this a welcoming space for businesses to come in? So how do we stabilize, create some predictability, and reduce the risk? So a couple things that we're doing, um, we've launched the Climate Catalyst Fund through the Infrastructure Bank. That's $50 million in low interest loans and loan guarantees for anything from biomass facilities to sawmills to the innovation around um, you know, can you turn this into liquid natural gas or mass timber, uh, you know, that'll replace steel and concrete and construction. So any, you know, anybody has, who's got a business that is going to help move wood out of the forest into a destination, they can go to the iBank for a large scale loan guarantee. Um, we also have, uh, we're developing these pilots with um, with GoBiz that the governor's business office that are working on creating woody feedstock aggregators. How do we create a supply guarantee when we don't own any of this land, right? The Forest Service can give out 20 year supply agreements. We're pushing them to do that. Um, but we can't um, as the state or any of you as you know small landowners. So how do we create supply guarantee of that wood so that somebody can say, sure, it's worth me investing $10 million of capital because I know that I'm actually gonna get 10, million, 10 years worth of supply um, off of this. And so we're creating these pilots to develop nonprofit woody feedstock brokers that would aggregate, they would go find it from small small projects and give it out. And Top Central Sierra Initiative is one of those pilots um, that is uh, starting to look through how do we take a wood basket and turn it into a predictable supply chain to then generate local economies. Um, and another area that we've heard is the transportation costs, right? We're seeing that we have a emergency around slash piles. And so this year we've just gotten funding uh, for Cal Fire to be able to have $10 million to be able to remove um, slash piles that are the most hazardous and get them to a destination um, that can consume them, such as like a, a biomass facility, um, or if it's you know lumber ready to take it to a mill. But um, so anyway, so we're trying to get these different elements in place, small loans, big loans, um, and feedstock supply so that we're removing the risk and the unpredictability in this market so that there's then room for the innovation and the markets to come in um, and generate that work. So uh, what's, what I want to leave you with is that unlike a lot of crises that we're facing, the wildfire crisis is solvable. And it is just a matter of keeping up this momentum and the scale that we're doing. We are seeing that that big fires that could have happened didn't this year because of interventions we had in place. We are seeing communities coming together. We're also happy to talk on the panel a little bit more about the regulatory environment and some of the other incentives that are trying to push communities to do that collective action around home hardening and defensible space um, and also to speed up projects. We, we, our, our mantra in this space is, or at least our goal in this space, is to try to get uh, the, all the prevention work to sort of a middle emergency phase so that we're not waiting years to get projects on the ground, that we can get them on the ground in a matter of weeks or at most a couple months um, once we have resources for those projects. And so we're trying to get to a, a point where we are moving quickly and responsibly um, in this space. And that's what we saw last year, right? Getting over a thousand projects on the ground um, in less than a year, having some of those projects with funding that came in April and September of last year, having those projects on the ground by last fire season. Um, in some cases that like we had one fire stopped in, in San Diego um, by a project that was ready by Thanksgiving um, for funding that had come just a few weeks earlier. And it was really exciting, or a few months earlier. Um, and it was really exciting to be able to see tangible results and, and these investments in resilience paying off dividends. So the beauty is that when we do this right, um, these investments then reverberate for multiple generations, right? That generation, we kind of look back at some of the political choices made in the early 1900s and think, thanks, thanks a lot, guys. And, um, and so what we can do right now is that when we're investing these resources and putting these projects on the ground correctly, we're not only improving community safety in the short term, we're doing it in the long term, we're building more resilient communities. We're also improving our ecology and the health of our forests and our biodiversity. 
the benefit is when we thin out these forests, we actually create water. Um, so I am thrilled that we are uh, working here together in this space, and we are excited to be able to partner with you. Um, so with that, let me hand it over to Heidi, I think. No? Okay, I'll, I'll hand it off. But um, just the last thought for all of you to take is just thank you. Um, thank you for being our partner. Thank you for being our innovators. Thank you for being our leaders. Thank you for modeling wildfire resilience that we now get to push throughout the rest of the state and also bring back to you paying off dividends through all of these programs. So our doors open, I'm really happy to continue to be your partner and excited to see the growth that is going on here. And 100 years from now, these generations are gonna look back at us and I want them to be able to stand up proudly and say they did it right. So thank you. Was outstanding and it was interesting I looked over at Scott and um, recognized that we're standing in a town that used to have its own sawmill and every town in the Sierra had its own sawmill to deal with this and so creating uh, an industry around utilization is key I just want to mention a couple things there are some good things happening RCRC is develop, developing some pellet technology to pelletize bio biomass and green waste which is really cool we also have the uh, Forest Futures Initiative, the Truckee Tahoe Community Foundation, that's looking at innovative ways for utilization, doing a lot of work in that space. Um, Dave Mercer has a Klondike Flat sawmill application that we've all supported, trying to look at that um, up north on 89 North there. So there's some cool things working. Also, I want to mention the Placer, I'm going to screw this up, Placer County North Tahoe Truckee Biomass Collective. And Cindy and I can tell you more about that. So there are groups working toward utilization, which I think is key um, in restoring that to uh, treat this problem. I did want to mention um, we're going to take a quick break so people can get warm and eat some food. And um, it's going to be very brief, and then we're going to come back and we're going to welcome Chairman Smokey here for our land acknowledgement and kick off our panel with Supervisor Hall and our other esteemed guests today. So please take a minute, and then we'll um, can reconvene in about 10 minutes. Thanks, everybody. Have everybody back. Any conspicuous faces missing in the return from the bat? They're probably out doing artwork in the top of the family barn there. Um, it's a real pleasure for me to honor our next guest and welcome him. Um, Chairman Smokey and I first had a conversation when I, I, I first got into office and we talked um, a little bit about the sacred tribal lands uh, that he has in Nevada County and it was one of the pieces that I think is disconnected from a lot of the narrative that we talk about today when it comes to conservation and sustainability. And I got to talk with him for a long time and, and learn a little bit about where some of these sites are. And then we concluded um, with the discussion about protection and how we can be a partner. Uh, to the tribe and it was it was touching and fascinating to me at the same time and also renewed my passion um, to understand that all lands in Nevada County and all counties are sacred and so with that I'd like to welcome Cyril, um, Cyril Smokey the chairman for the Washoe tribe Cyril Smokey is an enrolled member of the Washoe tribe of Nevada and California an elected chairman of the tribe he grew up on the Dresserville Reservation in Gardnerville Nevada when he turned 18, he joined the Army as a way to leave the reservation and explore the outside world. He ended up as a paratrooper in the 82nd Airborne Division and served with them in Operation Iraqi Freedom from 2003 to 2004. He served again with the Nevada National Guard, 45th Military Police Company in support of Operation Spartan Shield from 2016 and 2017. During his time in the military, he gained leadership skills. He began his higher education at Haskell Indian Nations University, studying business and tribal management. He ended up moving back to Nevada and changed his major. He has since earned his bachelor's degree in psychology. He continues to study and learn, trying to gain as much knowledge as possible. The tribal chairman is elected by the Washoe tribal membership as a whole from all four Washoe communities, the Washoe off-reservation constituency, and Washoe membership within the bounds of the Reno Sparks Indian Colony. The Washoe Tribal Council is the primary governing body for the Washoe Tribe and directs all tribal operations. With that, please join me in welcoming Chairman Smokey.
Thank you. Uh, oh, Mahaji. Our language is kind of a greeting that we usually use. It can mean multiple things. How do you feel? How are you? How do you think? Uh, but our language is um, a lot separate than many other languages around here, and especially around the state of Nevada, California, and all of our surrounding tribes. Uh, but to introduce myself, my name is Sorrel Smokey, I'm chairman of Washington Tribe of Nevada and California. Uh, it's real honor to be here today. I want to thank, thank everybody for being here. Um, thank you for the invite. Uh, I think it's real important that um, us as Washu people uh, are here attending you know, these functions because we are a part of everything that's going on all around these lands. Uh, these are our original homelands. This area here is even a little more important to me personally um, as this whole area of Truckee, Mardis, Mardis Valley um, was an original encampment of Washoe people. And this is, when we talk about history, it's not ancient history. My great-grandmother grew up here in a time before she was taken to boarding school uh, as a child. She was born at the mouth of the Truckee River uh, on the shores of Lake Tahoe. And her and her, her, and her family would to pack up their encampments and walk down from the mountains to this area to spend during the, uh, the winter months. <clears throat> but um, we, we, we've, we've traveled all around the Lake Tahoe area. If you don't know much about the Washoe tribe or Washoe people, uh, we, we've used the lands around Lake Tahoe to truly um, protect ourselves uh, especially when um, colonization started happening. Um, but, you know, these areas are, are really special to us. And even though we have once been removed, we, we're still here. And we'll do everything we can to protect these lands. And we understand that, you know, the history of everything that happened, we are where we are at right now. But we're not going to stop protecting lands. And that includes partnering working with everybody and appreciating the work that everybody's doing here as well. Because that's something we do also. Uh, the Washington Tribe of Nevada, California, you just heard the speech about the, the fires that happened. We had some of the most devastating fires to our Washoe lands uh, just last year with the Tamarack Fire and Caldor Fire. It's proven that Washoe people uh, have always intervened intervened or had an intervention in taking care of the lands, especially around here in Lake Tahoe with Washoe area and these lands out here. It's documented that Washoe people used to do their own prescribed burns long before anybody else was here. And they did that to sustain life. They would sacrifice a certain area around, around our, our living spaces knowing that we could never use it, or they could never use it again in their lifetime. But it would be good to use and come back and support life for future generations. And that's how we've survived all these years. Uh, some little, a little fact of history also is that right here in this area, um, an artifact was found, documented, carbon dated, goes back to just after the Ice Age. That's how long Washoe people have been here. We've been here for our entire existence. And that's why this place is so important to us. But also taking action now is something we have to do. Yes, we are being reactive. We haven't, we haven't continued those practices of taking care of the lands the way we used to. We've come to industrialization in a modern time with all of our de developments and now you can't just burn everything in a certain area. We have housing, you know, we have, we have residential areas, we have people living there, we have businesses. So we have to find a new approach. We have to develop a new culture that's gonna sustain us and our future generations. And I think that's what everybody's here is, that's, what, that's why everybody's here now, you know, to, to figure this out, to hear the stories, to hear, you know, what, what all the groups are doing and come together collaboratively to see what we can do so that we don't run into these issues again, so that we're being proactive and not reacting to something when that could have been prevented. It was just stated that wildfires can be prevented. They truly can. We just haven't been taking those actions in, uh, in a long time.
Um, right now, some of the things that the Washoe Tribe is doing uh, to address this issue is uh, we just started the first uh, sawmill uh, <clears throat> on Washoe Tribal lands down by Carson City. But it's pulling the trees out of here because that's been an issue for decades. For decades, there's, the, the forestry has had an issue with not being able to get enough trees out of the forest so that it just becomes more fuel for the fires. And that's, it's proven over and over again that it, it's happening. And that's a way for us to do our part and not only uh, promote a healthy forest, but also provide the need for lumber and also generate revenue for the tribe as well. So all of those things uh, coming together are you know, what we're looking for and what we're trying to do. We're not just uh, trying to get into any business venture to make millions of dollars. No, we're trying to protect our lands. But if we could do that, and so it's all uh, coming full circle, it's all, there's no leakage, everything stays within our communities, then that's what we're going to do. But <clears throat> overall, uh, you know, this is really just uh, land acknowledgement, and I don't really write out speeches because when I talk about these areas and talk about especially places that are near and dear to my heart and to us Washu people, um, something I, I like to say giving presentations around these areas are, you know, as all of you are here, uh, it shows to me that you are here because you respect these lands also. And that every time that, um, you're up here, whether you live here, whether you're just visiting, whether you're you know, here for work. Uh, every time you're up here, you smell the air, you take in the views, and you're feeling that part of Washoe culture with you. Because these lands have sustained life for thousands and thousands of years. And then now that we're taking action, all of us here, then we can ensure that it does for thousands and thousands more. Uh, but that's pretty much all I have to say. I don't, again, I don't have a big speech prepared, but I appreciate everybody being here. This is a very special place to all of us. Um, that's why we're here. So let's take care of it. Right, thank you. Great, thank you so much. And we're honored to have you here today as our guest. Uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Supervisor Hall, who's going to introduce our panel. So I'm just really excited to be able to just moderate this excellent panel. Uh, I want to thank Chairman Smokey for that very important historical perspective on this issue, and also um, to Jessica uh, Morris for that really, truly, amazingly comprehensive view of where we are with fire management and resiliency and probably the most hopeful message I've ever heard about it. So <laughs> I think we all appreciate that. Um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce, do a little short bio of everyone up here except for Jessica and then we're going to go into at least one question per person and hopefully have a little time for other questions. So if you have some uh, left over also from this morning, feel free to, to think about those. Um, Jody Holtzworth is a Deputy Regional Forester for Operations for USFS Pacific Southwest Region 5. She just, just let people know who you are. As Deputy Regional Forester for Operations, Jody Holtzworth brings extensive experience in conservation and land management issues for over 25 years, working both in the public and nonprofit sectors, including the US Fish and Wildlife Service and the Natural Resources Conservation Service. She's an avid outdoor enthusiast and is passionate about caring for our public lands. Next, we have Angela Avery, Executive Director for Sierra Nevada Conservancy. Angela leads the Sierra Nevada Conservancy by providing strategic direction and oversight to the agency's region-wide staff. As Executive Officer, she's committed to restoring the health and resilience of the Sierra Nevada region. She believes that by working with SNC's partners to implement the Sierra Nevada Watershed Improvement Plan, we can ensure that the region thrives for future generations and continues to provide California clean air, clean water, recreational opportunities, and spiritual respite. 
Angela joined the SNC in 2007 and became the Policy and Outreach Division Chief in 2015, where she focused on the development of sound science-based policy and the necessary outreach programs and strategic partnerships that support the Sierra Nevada region. Previously, Angela worked as a parks, recreation, and conservation planning consultant and managed forested land on the north coast of California. And finally, we have my colleagues, Supervisor Cindy Gustafson, District 5 Supervisor for Placer County. Prior to being appointed to the Board of Supervisors in 2019, Cindy had careers in the public and private sectors. After moving to North Lake Tahoe, she joined a local real estate firm and in 88 was hired as the part-time field aide to then Placer County Supervisor Mike Flutie. In 1991, she joined the Tahoe City Public Utility District where she worked for 26 years, filling a variety of positions, including serving her final eight years as the general manager, overseeing the full operations of the district. During her career, she secured and administered $30 million in grant funding for a variety of capital projects, including bike trails, sidewalks, water and sewer system upgrades, community buildings, public parks, beaches, and environmental restoration projects. In 2017, she took over as the Chief Executive Officer of the North Lake Tahoe Resort Association and North Tahoe Chamber, a position she held until she was appointed as District 5 Supervisor. Currently, Cindy serves as the Chair for the Placer County Board of Supervisors. Let's give our panel a hand. All right, and because we're a little late on time, we're gonna jump right in. And the first question I'm gonna ask is for Angela Avery. So, Angela, looking at efforts such as the Sierra Buttes Trail Stewardship Connected Communities Program that links mountain communities through multi-use trails, Nevada County has just launched our first ever recreation and resilience master planning process. Can you tell us about what role open space recreation and sustainable tourism can play in advancing conservation efforts and climate adaptation? And are there models or examples you would highlight? Supervisor, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Um, so it's a big question. There's a lot of different elements to it. I would start by saying that um, when I think about recreation, I think um, I think a couple of things. Um, SNC serves all or part of uh, 24 counties now. It's about 27 million acres that is in our service area. It's made up of wildlands and rural communities and small towns and there's a bunch of different uh, play, um, opportunities to go out and experience the variety of recreation opportunities that are, are available to us in the Sierra Nevada. So when I think about recreation, and I think about the region that we serve, I think that recreation is the place where is is the is the it's the place where people meet location, right? It is the place where we go, as you read in my bio for. Um, rejuvenation, for relaxation, for respite, for enjoyment. Um, I know when I worked in the tech industry many, many, many years ago, now um, I went backpacking. I left the city. I left to go and kind of find that place for myself. Um, and when the Sierra Nevada Conservancy thinks about recreation, we think about the Watershed Improvement Program, which has five regional goals, one of it which is vibrant work and tourism. From that perspective, we think of recreation in rural communities in the region that we serve as an economic driver, right? It's an opportunity for rural economies who are shifting from formerly timber-based economies to um, have an opportunity for workforce and development and, you know, and, and to bring people to the communities and, and create that place-based uh, experience that I think many of us desire. When I think about how we implement recreation as we're moving across the land and thinking about all of the things that Jessica talked about so eloquently earlier, we think from the Sierra Nevada Conservancy perspective about integration, right? How do you do, how do you make sure, and, and, and everything under the Watershed Improvement Program is integrated, right? It's all foundationally based on healthy forests and watersheds, um, but it needs to include resilience here in Nevada communities. It needs to include recreation opportunities. So when we're thinking about projects um, that are fuels reduction projects or there are opportunities for reducing the wildfire risk or 
the question I often ask is, how do you get recreation into that project? What does it, what does it look like? Um, the Wildfire and Forest Resilience Task Force, we're co-leading the recreation um, work group with the Forest Service, um, and we are trying to answer that same question. Like, what, is, what, is, what does it really mean to build recreation into wildfire and forest resilience projects? How do you do that? What does that look like? Greg's project, the Connected Communities Project, is a really good example of um, the way that the Sierra Nevada Conservancy works and tries to approach these things. We are a regional conser state conservancy. We don't do the work ourselves. We invest in partners at the local level to encourage and support their efforts to implement projects that are kind of holistic in nature. And I think Greg's, what Greg is doing with the Connected Communities Project in Quincy, that building that trail that will connect those communities, does all of the things that I think that I've mentioned. And it is reliant and will be interest to, interesting to see how he moves forward in the areas that were burned in the Dixie Fire, but it's reliant on healthy forests, forest of watersheds and ecosystems. So I'm, I'm rambling on. I don't know if I'm answering your question at all, but I think that um, I think all of these things are sort of important elements, right? And I think that the interconnection of place and bringing people to place and making sure those places are healthy and vibrant. Um, I think there, there are economic opportunities associated with all of that and it is the triple bottom line element of how the SNC works ultimately or how we try to work. So. Thank you, that's a big question. And Greg, are you here? Do you raise, okay, just raise your hand. So if anyone wants to learn more about connected communities when we get to the uh, that project, when we get to the networking, He's the man you can speak with, <laughs> All right? So we're gonna we're gonna move on to um, we're gonna ask Jessica. We can continue this um, conversation. Let's keep in mind that all of these questions are also considering how we're integrating recreation into all of the sustainability issues with fire and forest management. Um, but there's as we heard with from Jessica, there are so many different pieces. So take which piece you want to, to answer here. Um, we wanted to ask you about. Um, building climate resilient economy, Jessica, but I know we also chatted beforehand and you sounded like you had some exciting news about regulatory reform. So why don't you talk about that, if you'd like, um, and its connection to what we're, what we're doing here today. Heidi basically just asked me to be a policy walk. I'm very excited. Um, so yeah, uh, so how many of you have uh, had a project slowed down by CEQA or um, trying to get your environmental clearances through? How many of you guys got your CEQA and then you're like, oh my gosh, I need another permit from the water boards? What? They didn't even tell me. Okay, so so that's a bit of a problem, right? And, and the, the challenge we've been seeing across the state is that a lot of our environmental protection laws and regulations are designed to protect the environment from people, but they are not <coughs> nimble enough to help people protect the environment from climate change. And so we're trying to figure out how we get our, our, our rules to be faster without diluting the environmental protections that they come with, right? You don't want to build a fuel break and then discover that it's actually caused a whole mudslide, you know, and destabilized the slope. So we, they, those are, they are there for a reason, there's substance behind them. Um, and, and so we've thought, is there a middle ground between just creating exemptions and saying, no, don't worry about the environmental rules, um, and getting them down to their substance so that they can be fast um, and still provide the critical protections that we need to see. So what we've done is we did, we now have a, a permit that for wildfire resilience projects or reforestation or prescribed burns that, um, that you can actually get three for one. So if your project is larger than a CEQA exemption that you can get for a fuel break, um, you can get something called the California Vegetation Treatment Programmatic Environmental Impact Review. It really rolls off the tongue. Look for it on the Hallmark card. Um, but it's, it, I, we call it the CalVTP. Has anybody heard of it? Oh, we got, I got a couple. Thanks, guys. Um, and so the CalVTP is a 20 million acre pre-environmental review that was done. So it's a programmatic environmental review across all of the non-federal high fire risk lands in the state. And so what that does is it allows you to then say, all right, we've consolidated all the environmental review. And so you just have to do the mitigations for the type of environmental equities that you find. So if you find an endangered species, build a buffer. If you find, uh, you know, it just walks you through based on the species type and the topography that you have 
what steps to take. Um, and then you follow those steps and you're done. Um, and, and so then the next thing we did is so we said, okay, we've got CEQA down to, in theory, what's going to be a one-month process. However, it's a thousand page environmental review document, right? I don't want anybody opening that up from scratch and figuring it out. So what we did is we got a contract um, so that we have an environmental um, team that can do the first round, uh, or and now we're kind of making that permanent. So we have um, consultants already hired to do this for you um, and with you so that until this becomes really habitual, you're gonna have the pros help you navigate and say, okay, for for this um, ecology in the upper Sierra, I have now found all the mitigations and then people can use that as a template for the next ones, making their job a lot easier. But you'll now have sort of professionals help you do this so you don't have to figure it out on your own. Um, and so if any of you are starting a project that's gonna be, you know, like, a, thousand acres or something and um, and want to be able to use the Cal VTP we've got uh, free help for you um, to do that so that you're not sort of struggling with it so we've seen now the environmental reviews um, for the for that CEQA process come down from about two years down to about a month uh, which is really helpful the other thing we did is that water boards and fish and wildlife, because their permits often get triggered also, um, we worked with them to take, they each took their own unique approach. State water boards did a statewide permit that is automatic enrollment through the Cal VTP. So now when you go get your CEQA done through this Cal VTP, you also automatically get your water board permit because their mitigations are already included in this, in this whole document. Fish and Wildlife took a slightly different but still effective approach. They said, hey, you know, for, for you know, incidental species take and the types of permits you would need to protect endangered species and protected species, why don't we just, when you're doing fuel breaks or prescribed burns, you know, those, you can easily put in just protections. And so they put it built in all of the mitigations that prevent you from triggering their permits. Um, so you're already putting the environmental protections that they want to see um, so that you don't trigger fish and wildlife permits with this process um, because you just build a buffer around the species that you're that you encounter um, or adjust your fuel break by 200 feet, you know, so it What's exciting about this whole process is that we're taking a more creative approach to, um, to cutting green tape and saying, how can we consolidate this so we now have essentially, functionally, three permit permitting process consolidated into one um, in a single application with free help um, to be able to do it for you so that you are not going to be then backlogged into um, environmental review or have projects that could be life-saving that are then just sitting on the books or lost in bureaucracy for months. So uh, we're really excited about this and, uh, and hoping that it's a model for even broader um, regulatory reform that we have going forward. Oh. Wow. <laughs> yeah, give her a hand. So that's a, that's a mouthful. Is there some place people can go to get that information easily if they couldn't take notes fast enough? Yes. Uh, so I, I do, I will send you guys a, a very, clunky looking website. I'm sorry the state is not sort of tip top on graphic design and uh, we have stuff, but we've got a website that shows the entire wildfire resilience program on our investments and links to it including the Cal VTP and then the Board of Forestry website has the links to the Cal VTP as well. Um, and Angie, Angie has access to that, uh, that uh, contract that will uh, that will get you free help on this. So um, call Angie or me and, and we'll help you. Well, one other thing I should tell you guys, as long as we're talking about exciting regulatory reform, my friends, um, one of the other hurdles is that, as you know, not all of our land is uh, under state responsibility area, right? So what do you do? You're like, oh great, I got this fast process on state land and then I hit federal NEPA. Thanks a lot. And now I have to do two environmental reviews. Well, we have great news for you. Um, um, that we have um, just this last year we've extended what was a CEQA NEPA crosswalk so if you do NEPA you are then exempt from CEQA 
and we extended that so that it's not just going to be on um, fuel reduction projects, it's now for like reforestation and other forest health um, environmental type of projects you're going to do for all your fire resilience. Um, and then if you have to do other stuff uh, in there that you've contemplated in the NEPA, like build a road, you don't have it, you are exempt from CEQA in that process. And, um, and then we also said if you do your NEPA, um, you don't have to do, you can, that can also count on your state land. So if you have a project that has a bunch of mosaics of federal and non-federal land, you can do just one NEPA review across the whole thing and you don't have to then have multiple environmental reviews based on the jurisdiction. And then next we're going to work on making NEPA faster, Jody. Um, and, um, but at least this gives you some continuity. The other thing that was really new this year is that uh, we also have um, funding for, we had specific funding uh, for those different types of land, uh, land uh, jurisdictional types, including funding specifically for tribes um, for wildfire resilience. But we discovered that that accidentally triggered tribes to do CEQA because it was getting state grants when they don't typically. So we've exempted tribes um, from needing to do CEQA from our uh, from state funded grants. Uh, which uh, should help expedite things as well. Thank you, Jessica. That's all very exciting. Um, and you've set the bar high for now for this panel for how everyone's going to make things easier to get these, <laughs> <laughs> so these resiliency and sustainability projects um, moving forward. And on that note, so Jody, I'm going to ask you, I think, no, one of the huge, huge questions that we have now, we're hearing about all this money coming down the, the pike on the federal level as well, which you could probably speak to a bit. But the big question then for your agency and others is staffing, right? What steps is the U.S. Forest Service taking to recruit, develop, and ensure a pipeline of career professionals to ensure that California has the resources to manage its public land? Um, and do you see workforce development partnerships models with state and local jurisdictions? Yeah, thank you for that question, and it's a hard one, by the way. Um, first of all, I just wanted to say, uh, on behalf of the Forest Service, it's an honor to be here and to to work with the county and our state and our NGO partners. So thank you for the invite. We're really happy to be here representing the Forest Service. And also, you know, that we cannot do all the important work on our 18 natural national forests in this state without these partnerships. And so we are so grateful for all the work that happens on the ground and with those partnerships. And uh, Jonathan, who's here as our district ranger, has heard me say this before, but we're one of the countries or the only country in the world that has developed a national forest system. And that is incredibly uh, unique and amazing and it takes all of us to take care of our public lands and so uh, I'm just really proud to be here and to, to be taking care of our public lands along with all of you. Hiring, building capacity. So right now we have what I would call a once in a career opportunity to actually have money to do things on the ground. Uh, as you all know, probably just being around the Forest Service, it's been two decades of sequestration and struggle. A lot of our funding went straight to fires, uh, fighting wildfires and dealing with those issues. And we didn't necessarily have uh, funding to deal with uh, the management and the, and the land issues that we really need to deal with. And we also were at an all-time low as far as staffing capacity. Uh, you can see that on the ground as far as uh, our foresters and our recreation specialists among um, other staffing. So we are really excited that Congress has stepped forward and provided us more money than ever. And um, we have an unprecedented opportunity with our partners and um, also with the unprecedented funding that the state and others are putting forward to increase our capacity. So um, that is mainly what I do all day every day as, as operations um, for an oversight for, for the region for the Forest Service. We are working on hiring in every way imaginable and it is all hands on deck. We are doing national hiring events focusing on engineers, foresters, recreation specialists, partnership coordinators, um, and even our administrative side of the house. We are also working on regional priorities and trying to, to get that capacity we need on the ground as much as possible. Our goal um, starting at the beginning of this past calendar year was to plus up 20% in our staffing. We are not there yet, but we are working on it. It is going to take an all hands on deck and we are interested in 
how partners at the county, local, and state level can help us staff up, although I know we're all struggling currently um, with the current labor market and uh, with the housing crisis. So um, as we work really hard to hire folks, we are hitting uh, obstacles, and I'll be honest with you about it. Um, the labor market is difficult. It's uh, difficult to hire the foresters we need, the engineers we need, the biologists we need, the partnership coordinators we need, the recreation specialists that we need. And so we have an all hands on deck with all of our staff um, and um, our building rec uh, recruitment capacity as well to try to bring more folks into the Forest Service. But we also have issues that uh, make it difficult for us to retain staff. Uh, we do need community-focused efforts to help us increase housing options. I can uh, recruit entry-level positions until the cows come home, but if we don't have a, a place for those folks to live in some of these more expensive communities, it's just going to be hard for us to retain those staff. And so, you know, I have a plea out right now to work with our local communities, our counties, and our state to try to find some, some housing options and places for um, our entry-level and beyond folks to, to live in some of these communities and so um, that really is an all hands on deck. That being said, we are not going to stop. We are hiring as much as we, we can right now. Like I said, we are looking for a 20% increase um, in staffing overall. We have had some uh, fairly successful hiring efforts, um, bringing more foresters on, bringing more recreation specialists on and we're going to continue to do that until um, until we can't anymore and if an administration changes or those doors close on us but at this moment our number one priority besides uh, wildfire resilience and post-fire recovery is building capacity and increasing staffing the other side of that is is we really need continued help with our partners to get the work done on the ground we absolutely need to lean on those folks that can help us get the work done through contracts and agreements because we're not no matter how much we staff up we're not going to be able to do it alone and you all know that very well so those partnerships are critically important to us so that is what we're working on right now it's a big hurdle to climb we're going to continue to do what we can and um, anything that you can do to help us any partnerships we can do to get more capacity, we are all in and I would be happy to visit with anyone on any innovative ideas you may have. All right, thank you. That's a call to action for those of us in city or county government, uh, development developers um, to figure out how we can help make that happen. Um, let's talk biomass, Supervisor Gustafson. Uh, Placer County and Nevada County have been working with a variety of regional partners on exploring the opportunity of biomass. We hear so often that biomass is great, but can't pencil out without subsidies. In addition, it requires an entire surrounding private industry sector to be successful that is coupled with, at minimum, 20-year supply, transportation networks, stewardship agreements, dependable water, air quality challenges, the existence of timber mills, and knowledgeable foresters. And Jessica addressed some of the things that um, are out there to, to, to deal with that. Where is the project that you have been working on and what, where is that at and what are the keys needed to further unlock this opportunity? Thank you so much and again I wanted to also echo my thanks for being included today especially with the stars of the show over here. Um, but I'm happy to be here and um, tell you a little bit about the status of the project supervisor but also um, a little bit of background uh, so in 2007 there were some small fires that greatly impacted uh, South Lake Tahoe with the Angora fire 240 homes destroyed in South Lake Tahoe and then later that summer in Placer County we had the Washoe fire on Washoe Way just above Sunnyside only five homes were hit with that fire uh, but what we found was that it hit Forest Service treated land and came under control. Many of us were already evacuating the Tahoe City area when that fire hit because it looked so ominous and, and fortunately it was another great uh, story of resiliency. Is this working? Okay. Yes. I keep hearing the background. Um, and so with that, the Placer County Board of Supervisors started in on looking at a biomass facility as one of the solutions to dealing with the forest products. So back in 2013, 
Placer County adopted an EIR for a biomass facility at Cabin Creek, which is at the landfill site just outside of, um, between Truckee and Taos City, uh, at Cabin Creek. And um, during that time, when we went to look at the economics of the construction of the project, and with the um, lack of power sales uh, that we could get from that project, it didn't pencil. We'll fast forward and, by the way, for those of you who weren't here in the community at the time, there were protests. There were protests as the county looked at siting that facility, people afraid of truck traffic, of fumes from the biomass facility. Um, there were protesters in Tahoe City, in Kings Beach with signs, you know, at, at Board of Supervisors meeting. I was not on the board at that time, uh, but I was definitely watching uh, the political pressure. Well, fast forward, those catastrophic, those small catastrophic wildfires obviously became very large catastrophic wildfires, and I think all of the public sentiment about we need to deal with the biomass in our forests changed. Political will changed. And so with that, uh, when I took office and with Supervisor Bullock's support, we re-energized this effort to bring our communities together and try to initiate that project again at that site for um, the region. Uh, so it is moving forward. We're doing the financial calculations on it. We know we have a 20-year supply, uh, at least, <laughs> in our forests in and around this area. We have every one of our <clears throat> community uh, communities up here investing in protecting their communities, much like Marta's Camp. Many of our special districts and fire districts have supplemental funding to get the biomass and defensible space out. So we know we have the product. Now we just need to make it pencil. Um, we do have a challenge in that we do uh, sell our power to Liberty Energy. And Liberty Energy is not covered with some of the tax incentive programs that PG&E and others in California are. So we're trying to work through those, uh, those issues now. I am confident that when we look at what it costs us to truck our biomass out of here, the threat it is to our communities, that it is worth subsidizing. And that was not what it was in 2013. There wasn't political will to subsidize. I think we're there. Hopefully we won't have to subsidize significantly, but I think we're getting very close. And hopefully by next year we'll be announcing that we're moving forward. So. That's fantastic news, and I think um, it's gonna end up being a model for uh, the rest of the region who, who are also stuck with the same issue and are going to need to find out a way to make that work. Um, we have another question or two, but I wanted to think we have time to take a moment and see if there's an audience question. And I think we have, do we have a microphone out there ready to run, uh, Jamie? I just had a question um, regarding the, the NEPA CEQA. Is it for, um, you know, we're having to do NEPA CEQA for trails projects now. Is this going to is this going to be a shift in trail projects as well, or is it just uh, fuels management? That is a good question. Um, it is it is written around uh, fuel and wildfire resilience, and so I think if you can, if your trails project is also delivering fire resilience and doing that type of work, in theory, yes. Um, but we can we can pull up the exact language. I don't know if Angie, you know. I actually think you you're right, right? I think that the Cal BTP and the uh, 901 exemption really are written for fuels management. Um, but there are potential opportunities to build fuel breaks with trails, which I think you're thinking about to some degree. Um, and so I, I don't have a good answer, but I think Jessica Jessica Jessica's response was as close as I can get. Thank you. Any, any other? One more? Supervisor Hook? No? Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Uh, I'm curious. To know okay, can we make sure that's on? Thank you, Jamie. Thank you. I'm curious to hear from any of the panelists what your experience has been as you navigate decision making and policy transformation um, around rural regions versus urban and how this connects in your mind. 
Angela. There's a really important connection between urban and rural areas, but I'm not certain that um, urban folks maybe embrace the rural areas in the way that I feel like they could. <laughs> and in terms of providing advocacy or policy support, it's I think part of the reason that recreation, just to go to my original question, is so important. Many people leave urban areas. That was my story, right? I left urban areas. I lived in San Francisco for nearly 20 years, and every opportunity I got, I came to the Sierra Nevada. Um, but I think that I came here, and then I went back there and was engulfed in the issues of being an urbanite, right? <laughs> or the pace of being an urbanite. And I didn't do anything when I lived there to protect the places that gave me all of the, that revealed me as a human, right? Uh, so I think there's a lot of opportunity that is not necessarily being embraced to um, <laughs> better connect uh, the urban, make better, well, to improve that urban-rural connection and, and deeper understanding and that recreation is one pathway to potentially doing that. Um, and I also think it's an important thing. I think as, as was Jessica was talking earlier and talking about how the scale of fire is increasing across our region, the other place where I think we're going to be able to get where rural areas will get better support from urban areas is if our fires continue to impact their air, right? So tragedy is also an opportunity. It's not a thing I want to see happening again and again and again, but, but public health and public health impacts from wildfires in rural areas I think is another place where um, there's an opportunity to engage the urban audience a little bit better for, for more support. Um, so I don't know if that's sort of what you were talking about. I think there's a disconnect. There's a real and clear disconnect. SNC has been working on our messaging for years and years and years to try and build that bridge, right? Water is another place, right? We're continuing to suffer drought and we're continuing to have impacts to our upper watersheds. What does that do to water availability, water quality, water quantity, water timing, right? There are a variety of issues there as well. Jody, did you want to add to that? And while you're taking that, I was going to say water too. In my work with water, the water supply exists in the rural areas and the mountains, and um, it's important that we, I mean, we have to do better with education to the, ur to the urban areas that that's where their water comes from. Yeah. Jody, go ahead. absolutely, and and so so much to say about this, but our rural communities do get forgotten, and we could definitely do more on the messaging and the communications around that, but I do think the link is between recreation and the fires and the air shed, as, as you are all saying, and you know, Jessica so eloquently talked about the importance of the Wildfire Resilience Task Force and all the work that's doing from the governor and the Forest Service and many other partners, and there's a lot of effort there to communicate about the importance of wildfire resilience and, and protecting our local communities. And so I think that even that task force, the communications that's coming out of there is going to help. Um, and it is really important for us all to be messengers, I think, of the importance of these rural communities when it comes to where folks that are in their urban areas are recreating and they're affected by the smoke, they're affected by the water quality. And so the things that happen in these rural communities are completely tied to a 50% of the water that urban communities enjoy and need comes from the Sierra Nevada and I think that statistic gets lost um, so we can be doing much more and also you know when it comes to policymakers and others thinking about what else can we do to support these rural communities because this is where the action is going to happen this is where the the communities are going to get protected and we're going to do more of this wildfire resilience work these are the economies that we need to bolster, not only for recreation, but also um, for the biomass and the other kinds of work that we need to do. And so um, making the economic messaging and a priority is also really important. So I think you know one of my takes on that would be that we're all the messengers and we really need to talk about that more. We need to encourage our policymakers to have more conversation about that. Um, and then we also need to provide more resources, although we are doing so much, and I don't think people are aware of it, of all the resources that are available for, re for local communities and the rural communities and how important it is um, for them to take care of these recreation opportunities and, and to, to build the biomass plants and to have the, the small uh, mill opportunities and so much more. So I think we all have a hand in that. 
Yeah, thank you. I think that's a great point that we all have to be the messengers. And um, I forget, I assume people in the urban areas know what's going on in the rural and they don't often. Did, did you want to add on to that, Jessica? And I, then I, I want to send the question to Supervisor Hook. Yeah, next question. Um, I mean, I think there's a little bit of political reality here, too, you know, in terms of how policy gets made with that rural or urban tension. Um, and so, you know, in California, where you have a Democratic supermajority, which allows you to actually get some fairly nuanced policy through um, because it doesn't hit gridlock also means that that policy tends to get heavily weighted towards urban communities because that's where your political weight is. And it was an interesting example and lessons learned for me in terms of advocating for funding for Sierra Nevada Conservancy um, in our wildfire resilience budget, that 1.5 billion when it first went out, the initial reaction was like, we'll just we'll just give it all to Cal Fire. And Cal Fire was like, we will be crushed. Um, but you know, our staff cannot keep up with that. And so that, you know, that's how we were able to make the case to divide it among um, you know, 22 different departments so we could get all hands on deck and get the administrative support behind everyone to get those dollars out more quickly. However, because Sierra Nevada Conservancy is the anchor of the watersheds, also the largest conservancy in the state, we really saw them as an anchor for getting a lot of this wildfire resilience out. And so we're advocating for was 70 million for you guys? Yeah. Um, and and the legislature was like, no, give them five. What are you talking about? And, um, and instead, we want to give all these Southern California conservancies their dollars because that's where your political weight was. You don't have political heavyweights in the state legislature representing rural rural Sierra counties and um, and our mountain counties and so um, and so I reframed the problem when going to the legislature I said we need to protect your watersheds we need to protect our upper watersheds and um, you will not have water supply if we continue to have high severity fires in your upper watersheds so really reframing it as others were talking about to that forest to faucet connection so that whether you are in LA County getting your um, getting your uh, water from the Eastern Sierra, or if you're down in the Bay Area, getting your water from um, the McCollumie River watershed or the Feather River watershed, that that they make that connection. And so when we went in front of the legislature and advocated, we need $70 million for Sierra Nevada Conservancy to protect your water supply, everybody sat up, listened, and there was no fight over it anymore. We got the funding. And, and so that has enabled us to be able, it, it's about sort of helping urban areas understand um, that pressure. The other pressure that comes from some of these urban areas, and it's a little more fringe, um, but it still has some political weight behind it, are groups that are like, don't touch the force, let nature correct itself. You know, that sort of preservationist thinking still has weight, and I see it having weight, particularly in the media. Um, and, and so, uh, it's, a, it's a popular narrative of like just nature will correct itself and we're like no no everything is so far out of balance that we have to help get it back on track so that then nature can be um, back in balance and um, and so that sort of attitude that then creates pressure for only do home hardening and don't worry about anything else <laughs> and so we have to go back with them and sort of hold their hand back through you need your watersheds to be protected you will have 500 foot flame lengths coming on homes and the home hardening you've done will not make an impact <laughs> if you know if your forests around these communities are not protected if you're not getting regular prescribed fire and cultural burning back on the ground and so you know being able to sort of work through some of the politics of that of of sort of lack of understanding in rural areas, in, in urban areas, and um, and getting that educational foundation, as well as making the links in terms of demonstrating how it impacts them very directly. Thank you. Cindy, did you want to add on? Well, I think Jessica really hit the nail on the head of tying it to water, and that was my background, and just saying that, you know, the Sierra are the watershed for California, and so really tying that. The other thing I'd say is, is venues like this and why this is so important, and thank you again, supervisors from Nevada County, for doing hosting this. Our second homeowners, our visitors, need to be educated. They want to come here. They want to recreate. They have political influence at home. In those, in those jurisdictions. So mobilizing that force that we have behind us to say these areas are important as we watch climate change impacting and more and more people escaping the heat 
of the Central Valley and coming up or from Western Nevada to recreate in Lake Tahoe and Truckee and the High Sierra. Those people need to be educated. We need to continue our, pro our uh, efforts at sustainable uh, recreation in our communities and education of how to treat the forest and why they're so important. So we have great opportunities right now. That's great, thank you. And uh, Forest to Fawcett. Let's operationalize that. <laughs> I love it. Um, did you still have a question, Supervisor Hook? I think we have time for one last small, short question. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for all being here. Uh, this is probably Jessica. So we're talking about the big picture, but what are we doing for the folks that have like a 25 acre parcel? You know, there was an exemption for the forest plans that you had to do, because right now it's costing them more to do the work than to um, provide it. So we want to keep encouraging that. So is my, is my understanding that we're going to extend that? Could you talk about that a little bit? So we've got a program for small landowners that is called the California Forest Improvement Program through CAL FIRE. Um, it's been around for a little while, but it's been t historically funded at like $2 million. We ramped that up to $50 million last year and another $30 million this year um, for that program to meet more small landowners. Uh, what that does is that um, provides technical assistance so you can get a forester to be able to sort of write a plan for your um, forest and then it covers 90% of the costs um, of actually implementing that plan. So it allows the for small forested landowners to not have to try to figure out what to do with their land, but instead they can get a professional in there to say, all right, here's what you can harvest, here's what you need to masticate, this would be great for a prescribed burn, and then covers 90% of the costs. Um, to actually implement it. Great. Um, Hardy, are you? Where are you? Come on up. Okay, so I want to thank the panel. This has been a fantastic conversation. I hope we can do this again. And, um, you know, this, this to me, this panel is superb because they're big thinkers, but they're also practical implementers. And that's what we really need. And I think Hardy and I would like to um, just thank you and give you some challenge coins for participating, for being such a great panelist. And then we'll wrap up this session and Hardy will introduce the next one. Can, can I just say really quick how cool it is to be on a panel of all women with a women Woo! moderator? Look at Women in Fire. It's pretty cool. Very good, yeah. Thank you so much. Informative. Many questions for everybody. <laughs> Let's give our panel one last hand. Thank you all so very much for this excellent conversation. Okay. Thank you again to the panel. I hope everybody's warm now. I was warm and cold at the same time. Uh, I want to welcome Stacy Caldwell, uh, Tall Truckee Community Foundation Executive Director. And friend and Stacy and I have worked together for years and we pick up the phone and call each other when we misunderstand something or need information or want to check in and chat. And it's been such a pleasure to work with you in this capacity outside of the community advisory team and all the other commitments that you hold in this community and I, I hold you in such high regard. So if you can come on up, I want to read uh, Stacy's bio really quick and I'm going to turn it over to her to talk about philanthropy and our environment. Stacy Caldwell has served as CEO of the Tahoe Truckee Community Foundation since 2012. For over two decades, she has specialized in social innovation and entrepreneurship, impact investing, and venture philanthropy. During her time in Tahoe, she helped design a strategic plan that has launched many successful ventures, including Give Back Tahoe, Tahoe 50, the Mountain Housing Council, and Forest Futures, which have collectively raised and leveraged more than $70 million within our region. Stacy recently served as a 2022 Aspen Institute Fellow and is recognized as a rural futurist by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation with Future Good. Stacy has raised three boys in Truckee with her husband, Christian. She is a member of the Silicon Valley Modern Quilt Guild and anxiously awaits Nintendo's Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild 2. And with that, please welcome Stacy Caldwell.
Is it still morning? Good morning? Uh, yes? Good morning. <laughs> oh, gosh. Thank you so much. I'm a, I'm a little rusty here. Um, first, thank you, Supervisor Bullock, Supervisor Hall, for um, pulling this amazing group of community members and leaders together. Um, thank you so much, Scott and Martis Camp, for hosting us. Thank you, Chairman Smokey, for your land acknowledgement. We want to acknowledge that we do stand and gather here on unceded territory of the Washoe tribe, and we support your efforts to protect your sacred lands. So thank you for that. Um, so as I mentioned, I'm a little rusty. I have been on Zoom for the last two and a half years, which is really easy to have, you know, unstable internet challenges. No, I'm kidding. Um, so, you know, this morning I woke up and I was a little bit um, kind of not my normal, calm, cool and collective self. And during my meditation this morning, I read a prompt and the universe delivered. Um, Thich Nhat Hanh um, was my reading this morning and it said the best thing we can offer to the world is our insights. And so I've been asked to share my insights about philanthropy's role in this work and the power of public-private partnerships, which you've heard so much already today. Um, and so that's what I'm gonna do. And thank you for your patience as I get comfortable up here. Um, I kind of wish I was sitting out there with y'all. Um, it is really awkward. Um, okay, so I was once told money is the answer, what is the question? Um, and on the surface, that really resonates, especially knowing when, um, what happens when there isn't enough resources to try and fix a problem. Um, and philanthropy's role traditionally has been to help the most people when we can and where we can. Um, and oftentimes, resources align in a very reactionary way to do just that. When a family's hungry, we make sure that they have food. When someone is unhoused, we help them find shelter. When California is on fire, we increase the statewide budget for firefighting. When someone has a health crisis, we send them to the, a the ER. And in these examples, philanthropy naturally demonstrates our generosity and our kindness and our mutual responsibility. And all of this is important, but it's also really expensive. It doesn't take long in this work of philanthropy to realize that throwing money at a problem most of the time doesn't fix the problem, especially the big ones. And so you find yourself asking what many on this panel are actively doing in their roles as elected and appointed officials. How do we get in front of this crisis? How do we find the right levers to change the systems? How do we turn our toughest challenges into our biggest opportunities. And when it comes to our toughest challenges, think housing, mental health, climate change, those that are too big for any one organization to fix, any grant to make a dent in. It requires aligned resources, leadership, community engagement in the conversation, trusted relationships, and commitments for the long haul. At the Community Foundation, we think about this as community readiness. Without those elements, funding is not optimized. Without readiness, system change cannot happen. Philanthropy without readiness can be a waste of time, resources, and it's undemocratic. How we create that readiness is an important question for us all. So, with that, I want to shout out to my board members who are here, Jeff, Kristen, I think there might be the others, Jerusha, and all the board members and volunteers who have stewarded, oh, and Cheryl, or Cheryl, there you are. Um, all, the, all the board members, past and present, who have stewarded the resources on behalf of this community, as well as our staff who've joined me here today. Um, we think about this readiness element often, and I can share a few things that we've learned along the way. So it all begins, at least at TTCF, with the on-the-ground work and the partners, many of whom are represented here today. 
anything that we think resources should flow to, we first have to verify or ground truth check that information. So our team at the Community Foundation really holds sacred the partnerships within the nonprofit community that is here today and beyond, as well as our public agency partners and our private sector partners um, in the business world. So we really have to engage the broader public um, in these conversations and ensure that unlike-minded people are sitting around the table shaping the solutions that we seek. When like-minded people get together, you know, it's kind of easy to come to a conclusion, but when unlike-minded people have to really work and toil over what those solutions are and ensure that all voices are heard, then we know those solutions are gonna have a better chance of sticking and being effective. We have to begin with data and stories. Data is important and data is complicated. At the Community Foundation, under the leadership of Allison Schwedner and our Community Collaborative, we are grounded in data related to economic well-being, housing, education, health, mental health. And every year we have to look at the methodologies of that data that we're tracking across a very complicated region. We know that jurisdictions have data. We know that public agencies have data how that data comes together to really represent the unique ecosystem that is this region and beyond is a little bit of a hat trick on an annual basis, right? <laughs> um, but that data has to be measured and married with the qualitative aspects of what's really happening in our community. So we have to look at the data and then again, we have to go back to the community and make sure that it aligns these, all be, these elements start to build a better picture of how we can move forward as a community on these system change ideas. Educating our community and engaging them in this process is key. We've already seen what can happen when maybe it just didn't happen or it was an oversight or maybe we just didn't do enough of it. We have examples that we share with our ranger district, our district ranger Jonathan Fisher Cook who's here with Big Jack East, a trail that is right through here in this, in this valley. When the Forest Service began working on a thinning project, the community didn't understand what was happening and they started to resist. Where there's not education engagement, the community resists. We have example after example of that. Cindy referenced the biomass facility from 2003, did she say? Where would we be today, right, if we had some of those things in place? So it's important for us to be engaging the community and bringing others into this conversation to shape it. Mapping capacity and networks. So each of us has a different mission that we're here representing. And we all have a network that our institutions connect to. The stronger connections or nodes in these networks, the more successful we're gonna be and be bringing that awareness and rolling out the solutions and aligning and attracting community resources. So these pieces start to build on what we see over and over again to the things that are successful in our region, which are these regional collaborations. We have to come together. We have to kind of cross-check information and truths And it's messy, and it's expensive, and it's really challenging. And for a long time, donors and funders did not see the value of that capacity to bring together collaboration. At the Community Foundation, we really pride ourselves when we bring people together, there's an agenda. We really pay attention to who's in the room. We make sure that people have their voices heard that work can be really challenging and it takes a long time, often. But once we get it right, we start to see momentum. We start to see resources flow and we start to see and find our voice in bigger circles. And I believe what we have heard today is the beginning of our voices being heard in this region, beyond this region at the state level and in our urban communities. So there is a higher calling for philanthropy today. It's not just reacting to the moment, 
Short-term solutions are important. We have to take care of each other, and people have needs. But we need to be paying attention to those long-term objectives that cross generations in our community, and philanthropy is really set up to do that. We have to think about our resources as regenerative, as well as the financial capital that we're investing in those solutions. So, today I'm here to say we've seen what success looks like in a number of different ways, big and small. Recently, we were able to show that education and engagement um, as a community at the, um, the new rec center in the forest fire exhibit. For those of you, anybody, can you raise your hand if you saw that? What a powerful exhibit. It began with an idea of two artists really wanting to tell the story. TTCF put some seed funding into it, Excellence in Education picked up a significant amount, and the Nevada County Arts Council then really took the lead and rounded out that funding to make that exhibit happen, to educate and engage our community. Our school district was engaged, our nonprofit sector was engaged, um, and we were able to really tell that story. And we have hopes that it will continue to travel, not only throughout the region, but at the state level. From COVID, we've learned that there are ways that we can convene ourselves to prepare for disaster. And during disasters, we can actually be a little more coordinated with the community organizations. So during a disaster, whatever it might be, whether it's a wildfire or COVID or all sorts of other ways that we experience um, this trauma as a community, we've learned a few things. And communities around the state of California are organizing community organizations activated in disaster. During those disasters, the, the experts, the professionals come to the table and they should be in charge, clearly. But the community wants to help. And sometimes help can get in the way if we're not organized and accurate with our information. So this year we have helped launch regionally community organizations activated in disaster, COAD. We can point to where things need to go. Um, I guess I would say 20 years ago, Sierra Business Council was one of the first on the scene at Loyalton trying to figure out how that space could be activated for this conversation here. And over the years, leadership around the region really started to sit up and figure out how to do that. So philanthropy has a role to point to things. Hey, what about that over there? This community over here is doing a great thing. We can de-risk innovation for our public partners as well as private industry. Um, the Community Foundation was able to do that recently with landing locals. We paid for a market, so, um, a market research study on how second homeowners use their homes and look for ways in which we might be able to figure out how to unlock some of those houses for our local community. With that market research, we felt comfortable then making a seed grant to a local business that was launched called Landing Locals. Landing Locals is now a collaborative partner with both the town of Truckee and Placer County to help subsidize those programs to unlock second homes for our local workforce. We can invest in early stage ideas. There's a safe parking program uh, that one of our former employees was very passionate about and we were able to partner with some of our local jurisdictions and agencies to really think about how would we go about doing that. It's complicated. It takes all of us coming together. The Community Foundation has made a grant to get that started up and we're taking those steps to move forward with the idea of a safe parking program because we know when there's no housing people stay in their cars and in the winter that's not good. It's not good all year long. We can leverage funding and get creative with community capital. And again, we have experience with this. We're able to um, you know, put seed funding in or community capital in so that we can secure more tax credits or we can make certain industry opportunities like sawmills, pencil. We have patient capital. We have the low market capital. We have to think differently and more creatively with the way the dollars flow. And we can incentivize the private market to start to build their own solutions. 
And so with that, we have a social enterprise that Mountain Housing Council has been working on for nearly four years called the Housing Hub. And I kind of wish, Jessica, you could take your regulatory innovation and apply it to our housing situation. So more work for you to do. But, um, you know, this is where we have to make it easier on those who are coming forward with solutions. And philanthropy can play that role. And then finally, this interconnectedness of all these issues. So we can talk about sustainability and focus on the forest, but sustainability really has three drivers to that, community, economics, and the environment. And these can, the, you know, housing, mental health, economic um, you know, resilience of our community are all interconnected and philanthropy plays that role. So today we're talking about sustainability and so much of it has been about the forest that I would be remiss not to talk a little bit about. I just realized I had my sunglasses on the whole time, but you probably can't see me anyway, so that's okay. Um, I, I feel compelled to share with you what we're doing about Forest Futures. Um, so Forest Futures is an initiative of the Community Foundation. We spent four years really learning about all the things that so many of you live and breathe every day to make sure that our philanthropy was in the right place and that we weren't moving too fast with the wrong ideas of where the dollars should flow. But we really landed on a strategy that measures success in three areas, protect our community, build infrastructure, and incentivize market-based solutions. So in the protect the community, it's very much what you would think it would be. It's ensuring that our neighbors can pay for and execute on defensible space make sure that our Forest Service has the resources they need for fire breaks, um, early warning detection, right? Just protect the people and the assets of the community. Um, and much of the dollars that we've raised to date have really gone into that category. The second area is infrastructure. And this is where you hear us talking about biomass processing facilities and small diameter sawmills um, and the workforce. So we're really focused on how do we make sure that infrastructure is strong because when the community is protected, protect the infrastructure is strong, then the market-based solutions can really kind of show up with a sense of confidence that um, they have something that they can work with. So those are the three areas of impact that we're measuring success on. It's a $30 million campaign in three years. Our board really set a high bar to really show our community that we're serious about this work. It actually is interconnected to our housing work and our family strengthening work, um, but it is something that we're proud of. We've raised over $5 million to date. We secured one of those CAL FIRE grants that helps re-grant back into the community, so we're excited to roll that out. Um, but I think what else is exciting about this program is it is a more creative capital structure. So we're not only talking about grant making, but we're also talking about low interest loans, patient capital, and equity. So we want that full spectrum as well as a hybrid endowment that regenerates along with that loan fund because we know that this healthy forest that we're um, getting to sit under today is going to need more work in the next 10, 15, 20, 30 years. If we're successful, we're always participating in helping um, that healthy forest regenerate, but hopefully it's not as difficult as it is and as risky as it is today. One of the biggest questions we get when talking to donors about forest futures is, well, the state just has all that money now. Why should we be giving our philanthropic dollars to this effort, right? And I would, I would point to the way our partners today talked about how we work on the ground, how we have to have this readiness in our community. We need those seed fundings. We need to point to best practices and we need to come to the table with creative, flexible, nimble capital that represents the community's will to actually attract and leverage those public and private dollars. So that's what we're doing at Forest Futures and I welcome any questions about that. And I'm on, what do you call it, the, the final lap um, so that you guys can chit chat and I can't believe I've been wearing these the whole time and they're not even my reading glasses, but somehow I'm managing. 
Communities around the globe are facing their own version of climate change and climate action. Our communities in the forest and the mountains have a front row seat to this. We see it firsthand and we must be ready. Communities must be organized and coordinated. Those closest to the problem are also closest to the solutions. Our regions are complex and can be, um, and this work can be rewarding, but it's also really hard. As rural regions, we have to play with a different set of tools and, a diff and it at a different scale. Our built infrastructure has a lot of attention paid to it right now. These are the physical structures and systems that allow our communities to function like roads and bridges. But civic infrastructure, the culture and systems that allow people to connect and work together, get information, solve problems, and create a thriving community are just important. Philanthropy and private sector are part of that civic infrastructure that needs equal attention and development equal to roads, bridges, and land management. With two years of budget surplus at the state, the Infra Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, and recent Inflation Reduction Act, resources will be flowing into our communities like never before. For those of us lucky enough to call this region home, we live in a place worth protecting, not only for the reasons of beauty, and economic opportunity, but for the role that our environment plays at the state and for our planet. So as I look across this audience and see so many of our partners who could be up here giving the same speech, I see so much for us to build upon. We must simultaneously take the long view and act with a sense of urgency. So I leave you with this, some inspirational words from somebody who has inspired me through some of these difficult times. Otto Schumar is the director of the Presencing Institute at MIT, and I'll leave you with this. Human beings are the only beings who can reimagine and reshape their own future. We can change rules, goals, and paradigms that dictate our civilization and societal patterns and forms. This is essential for the future of our planet and humanity. Thank you for the work you do. Thank you for taking time out to be here today. Thank you for the gift of being able to engage in this conversation. Um, that's all. Thank you. Thank you. We're close to conclusion. I'm standing between you and a plate of cookies and probably a lunch somewhere or another Zoom meeting. Um, you know, I was thinking and listening and trying to be part of this and um, strategize on what we were doing here. And, and I had some quotes I wanted to share with you. This is from Chairman Smokey, and I'll tell you what the quote is, and then I'll tell you what it means to me, and then I'm going to do a couple more, and then I'm going to let Chair Hall speak a little bit. But what he said was, we are all part of this place. We're all here because we all care and honor these lands. And what I think about is that we share in the protection of these lands. It's our responsibility that I heard from him to us today. And I want to carry that away when we leave here. Another quote from Jessica Morse, we have policy to protect the environment from people, but we need them to work so people can respond to climate change. I think this is really interesting when you talk about policymaking and leadership in government, which is slow and bureaucratic and cumbersome, is that it's all incumbent upon the policymakers to streamline that and get to the bottom line where the policy and the funding and the narratives that we have create actual change. And I think that's important for us to remember. And then finally, what Stacy said that, that resonated with me, she said, what are we doing to solve big problems that one entity cannot solve alone? And what I thought as she continued to describe her effort through philanthropy in our community is how do we as policymakers and government officials and leaders and senior staff how do we remain nimble? How do we react? How do we preserve um, the energy, the limited energy that we have from the taxpayers that provide it to us and respond in a way that's meaningful? Because we can get we can get quagmired and bogged down. Coming out of COVID is a great example. We got sidetracked, but we're off of that now, and that's why we're here today. Um, a few takeaways for me, um, Anna Klostad mentioned, hey, what are you going to talk about action steps, action steps, action steps? 
and as somebody I highly uh, recognize and, and respect in this field, um, I, I'd like to say a few words about action steps because there are local initiatives that you can get involved in. So one example is the South Yuba cohort in Western County, collection of a bunch of leadership in that area to preserve the South Yuba River co corridor, um, huge amount of impact in that area. Up here we have the Climate Transformation Alliance that Anna founded. Um, it's a great group. We're actually meeting tomorrow. A uh, huge number of solutions coming out of that group and a way to convene people. And then I have the Champion Convene Catalyze CTA um, that we've worked so hard to tilt up. And Colleen is here. I, is Colleen, can Colleen raise her hand? I want to acknowledge her. Colleen is awesome. Um, thought leader in this area and has been so instrumental in getting the Triple C group tilted up along with our county staff. But these are some tactical ways that you can get involved to take action steps. And those action steps can be aggregated into a regional approach that we share and the connections we've made here today we can take away and connect the dots. Um, act locally and, and think globally. Um, the one piece, there is also this connection between fire and resiliency and conservation and sustainability and recreation. And I think it's incumbent upon all of us to, to have those conversations and promote that narrative. I think it's a unique connection that's just now coming forward. And I think there's um, amazing opportunities as we see funding come down from the state and federal partners connecting all of those dots. And when we talk to Greg after this, I think Greg checks about every box he could possibly have in the Connected Trails um, community that he's developing. So it's really interesting to see these connections. I think we all need to continue to promote that. And I want you to send all of your bright ideas to me about this uh, event for next year. So we can do year number two. This is the inaugural event. Please send me your thoughts and comments so we can make it better and make it something that we can look forward to every year. Um, thanks to our speakers and our guests. And uh, after this, we're going to gather a network. And I'm going to turn it over to Supervisor Hall for a few words. And thank you again. Thanks, Hardy, for, for bringing that all together. And I just want to say a few things. I think um, to take a step back again, there's, I think there's one clear sub-theme that's gone through all of this that you've heard from everybody. And uh, I can use my, it's one of my favorite words to describe it, it's collaboration. We are in a time of unprecedented challenges, unprecedented threats, and the need for unprecedented action, right? Unprecedented collaboration, maybe radical collaboration. So this is no time, we have no time now for small p politics among us, between us, among the agencies or between the agencies. There's no time for egos and fights and agency uh, pr you know, priorities fighting each other or missions fighting each other. It is a time for us to work deeply connectedly and radically together to address this unbelievable challenge we have, which also has an, is an unbelievable opportunity to look at how we are sustainable, resilient now and into the future and set up something new and different for our grandchildren so they can see that we took a look at what was going on we did something different. We changed the rules to what you just, uh, what we just heard from that quote, um, and we're going to move forward in a way that is new and different to take on this unbelievable challenge and and something do something we can be collectively incredibly proud of. I hope what we what we did here today is a start of that conversation, and that we can continue that in the coming years. Thank you all for being here.